to launch right into it? Okay, I'm going to do that. Thank you as well. Uh, just bear with me here. Being in the interest of time, I am going to stay fairly close to my notes, so that'll have you looking down here a little bit, and uh, it'll keep you from wandering around too, which I've been told not to do. <laughs> so, uh, uh, thanks again for inviting me to participate in the panel discussion. Uh, you know, the topics that we're that are on the agenda tonight are really important. It's good to have a discussion between government policy people and the University of Manitoba and the research is associated with that institution. It's good to have the public connected into, do, into this conversation. I hope some of the issues and the policy uh, aspects that I'll raise tonight kind of highlight the importance of, of broadening and, and continuing discussions like this. I'm going to begin with an overview and a bit of a recap for those who may be less familiar with the specific details of Manitoba's uh, immigration success story and its policy context and, and the broader national policy context in which this strategy continues to evolve. I'll dedicate a little time to some description of how we've managed the impacts of the growth that, that WILF has shown and talk a little bit as well about the evolving policy and program environment from which we're trying to draw the lessons that will help us manage the challenges that uh, you know, are still with us. And hopefully this will position us well for some uh, consideration of a few of the questions I'll leave off with at the end around those current policy and program challenges, you know, as they apply currently and, and kind of where we're going in the future. So I'll start off a little bit just by talking for those a little less familiar with how immigrants come to Canada with a few basic points about uh, who gets in. Uh, immigration in Canada is a shared jurisdiction between the federal and the provincial governments. Now this unique aspect of Canadian federalism provides the framework for what has become a very dynamic and innovative field for public policy and programming. What, while the Constitution and national legislation give primacy to the Government of Canada, they also legislate a responsibility for us to work collaboratively as provinces with the federal government and vice versa and in consultation with Canadians. Permanent Im immigrants, as the slide shows, come to uh, Canada through three main categories, economic, uh, family class, and humanitarian. For tonight, I'm mostly going to focus on the selection processes for economic immigration, just given the time that we have. Um, start off by noting that over the last four decades, Canada has contributed at least two major innovations to immigrant selection policy, selection policies which have been replicated in a number of other countries. The first is what we call the human capital or points-based system. And the second one is the, are the provincial nominees programs that contributed most of that growth that Wilf has described. Both of these have fundamentally changed our thinking about how we select economic immigrants. Now in 2015, the Government of Canada is, long, has, is launching a new and also innovative system called Express Entry. And this will ha also have significant impacts on how immigrants are selected, both federally and provincially. This system was adapted from models in New Zealand and Australia. Interestingly, Australia was an early adopter of Canada's points system and has happily returned the favour uh, uh, of giving back to us what some argue is a, a new and improved version. Uh, we shall see. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea about how the immigrants are coming to Manitoba specifically, I'll, I'll begin by noting that until the late 90s, uh, Manitoba was an immigration have-not province. Uh, since uh, the two world wars of the last century, uh, the, the story was one of, of, of more or less continuous declines in uh, Manitoba's position as an immigration destination of choice. That really changed in uh, 1998 with the introduction of the provincial nominee program, Manitoba being the first province after Quebec to have a, a provincial immigrant selection process. This slide gives you an idea about where that provincial nominee program fits in in the national scheme of things. Uh, through the PNP, Manitoba was able to nominate both skilled worker and business applicants for permanent residence under the federal economic class. And Citizenship and Immigration Canada always retains the final authority for decision making and visa issues. A few things I'd like to note. As you can see from this diagram, both international students and temporary foreign workers have established pathways to permanent residence through both provincial and federal programs. Manitoba was actually the first province to create a dedicated pathway for both 
TFWs, temporary foreign workers, and international students. BC was very close, same year actually. And CIC followed later with the creation of the Canadian Experience class. This diagram though doesn't show you how express entry fits into the picture. I'll talk about that later. But think about it as a, as a front end inventory management system in front of those uh, federal economic programs, the federal skilled worker trades and Canadian experience class. In 2015, a number of provinces will be streaming some of our own no uh, provincial nominees through this new system. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later. So just uh, this is a slide that will show uh, or a similar version of it. What I want to kind of use it to do is, is to show you a bit of <coughs> how this story played out in Manitoba. Um, largely through three, fa three phases, but the first thing you can notice in this slide is how, uh, what a dramatic change it occurred from 1998 during that first growth phase when, when the PNP came into being, and then uh, a, a very significant growth phase that occurred after that, which is only now starting to level out. I call that first phase there a pilot phase because it was uh, formerly a pilot program based on our agreement with the federal government. And, and at that time, we was largely uh, experimenting with different approaches to selection. We essentially adapted the point system that the federal government used for Manitoba purposes and added in a high demand occupations list to help us select people. And then in 2003, we were given more significant targets. We took a lot of what we've learned in terms of engaging local stakeholders and partners in the selection process. Another unique feature of the provincial nominee programs, we rely a lot on working directly with employers and communities and municipal stakeholders and to, to help uh, attract and, and retain people in the province. And it was by leveraging that as well as the snowball effect that uh, is created by allowing successful immigrants to sponsor their skilled relatives back home. Now, I, I won't I use this word sponsorship advisedly, I should really say support because it's not a sponsorship process. But they are allowed through the PNP process to support the applications of their skilled relatives back home and that has helped to uh, amplify that those growth trends that we've seen um, in, in that chart. 2014, you know, you'll see that little spike there, that's going to be a, a bit of an unusual uh, situation. We're kind of waiting for the final data to be in but we do anticipate that it will be another record-breaking year but this is for uh, different reasons of uh, dynamics happening overseas and at the federal level. I, I can get into during questions if you like. But this, if you want to see what the PNP itself has contributed, those blue bars really show you what the contribution of the, of the provincial selection process has been to, to the province. And after that initial piloting phase, how it really kind of took off, off here. Uh, a couple of points I would note about the intake from the family and humanitarian categories is that these levels have remained relatively constant throughout this whole history. Um, and, and that's a good thing for us. We continue, you know, it, the impacts may not be quantitative in terms of what they produce, you know, for the overall levels picture, but they are important contributors to the economy and society overall. They're also uh, important end users of the PNP. Many folks who come to Manitoba and establish through other programs then use the PNP to support the applications of their relatives. This one will give you a sense, uh, Wilf indicated in, in broad terms the regions that people were coming from. This will give you a sense of what countries are, are uh, their source, uh, uh, countries of origin. Um, Philippines and India remain at currently our, our top uh, two source countries, but it's important to, to uh, note that there are more than 90 different source countries uh, that, that immigrants to Manitoba are coming from, and that if you could unpack some of that data over the years, you would see very interesting narratives of stories of different uh, types of, of, of migration dynamics. At any time in the last 10 to 15 years, you've seen countries like Argentina, uh, Ukraine, Germany, uh, Israel, and so on be in the top five. Um, it, it, it changes over time based on, on, on shifting migration and immigrant dynamics, but there's a lot of interesting stories that it, within the smaller details. It's also in Manitoba a story about uh, you know a fairly good distribution of immigrants. Part of that I think is importantly related to the participation of key stakeholders in in the in, in business and in in the communities and participating in the program. Twenty to thirty percent of immigrants coming to Manitoba have gone to uh, regional destinations. So they're not all just coming to Winnipeg, and we continue to work with 
uh, employers and communities to find more innovative ways to, to promote and recruit their communities and, and labor market opportunities to people overseas. I think one of the important pieces of our success story has been, if you look at the spread of, of uh, the economic sectors and, um, and the occupations of the people we're nominating, it lines up pretty closely with where economic activity is in Manitoba. We have a diverse economy in the province. We similarly, through the program, have nominated a greater diversity of occupations and skill sets than I think you'll find in any other immigration selection system in Canada. So this is another area where a lot of more quantitative research would really benefit uh, our understanding of what's happening to these folks. We know that the skill levels are lining up very well at the time of selection and nomination. We also know that immigrants are taking longer to find jobs in those same skill, at those same skill levels when they get here. But according to some studies, a lot of the studies that, you know, that you'll currently find are smaller sample studies. They are survey-based studies. These are all valuable, but it points also to the need for a lot more quantitative research. What we know now is roughly about 30 to 40 percent of our PNs are not working at the skill level, uh, which at least they self-identify as having before they came to, to, to Manitoba to Canada. Um, uh, there's some interesting, uh, you know, reasons for that, and some at least some explanatory factors. Manitoba is unique in that 70% plus of the immigrants we select are coming without prearranged employment. They find jobs after they get here. So one of the things you need to factor into the data, that laddering up through the labor force that immigrants do and the time it takes, is the fact that they are essentially, you know, joining a lot of other people entering the workforce and competing for those positions with other Manitobans and, and, and Canadians. Um, now I say that, but it's also important to note that during those periods of significant growth, an interesting dynamic, the uh, employment rate um, has not significantly increased even during the economic downturn. That uh, with, even though we've seen uh, peak levels of immigration, it has had not had a negative effect on the, on the employment rate. So that you have to balance out these, these two different factors. Um, I think Will's already talked about the unemployment uh, rates for immigrants comparatively across jurisdictions, so I'm going to skip that. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing to uh, uh, improve the labor market outcomes of immigrants who are coming here, because I think wherever, whatever that data indicates, I think we're all agreed we need to do better in addressing some of the issues that immigrants are facing in getting uh, better outcomes from the labor market. Part of what is worth remarking on here is that for 15 years in, in managing these programs, Manitoba had the advantage of not just administering a immigration selection process, we also managed settlement funds and settlement, uh, the settlement system in Manitoba. And what this created for us was a really good feedback relationship. We could take what we learned from what was happening post-arrival in the settlement context, apply it back in to the, the selection process. We could use that whole, uh, those linkages to create what I was pictured in that diagram as what we call a continuum of service approach. Um, that, you know, we can think about what's happening, what we call from the selection process and, and use that to inform our pre-arrival and post-arrival uh, settlement services. One of the outcomes of this, or that, uh, that I'll just briefly touch upon, is what we've indicated in that diagram is that big blue building is a, is a consolidated labor market service called Manitoba Start. And what's unique about this program is that, and we're the only province in Canada to do this, is we're able to register every immigrant who arrives in the province within the early days, weeks of arrival. We can even increasingly do a pre-arrival with our improving data systems. And connect them through a single doorway that gives them an initial assessment connects them to the services that they individually need at that time, be it language training, settlement, or so on, and fast track them into an employment readiness uh, support uh, program that will also facilitate their job matching with employers. So we've been investing with the fed some federal dollars as well into this program to improve it. Part of what we want to do now in our investing in right now is improving the supports for qualifications recognition. Give better guidance, at arrival and pre-arrival to people who need to navigate pathways to full certification. 
One of the things people constantly say when they are being surveyed is, we wish we had known. I wish I had had this information pre-arrival. So part of what we're trying to do with Manitoba Start and the way it provides feedback back into the selection system is do a better job of these things that immigrants are telling us they're missing. Um, we need to do that because um, I'll, I'll, I'll be told to wrap up, so I'm going to spit rid through the, uh, the rest of these. But here's a, just a quick picture of, of the employment gaps that we're looking at down the road. We, can afford, we can't afford not to make the most of the skills that immigrants are bringing here, not just for their own sakes, which are important, but also for the sake of the labor market. We need to have them working at the skills they were trained uh, to work in if we're going to fill those gaps that are indicated on that, uh, on that slide. Just quickly, here's some other things that are changing right now and should inform our thinking about the policy challenges we're facing. This is a bit of a, uh, sorry, it's a little bit uh, convoluted, but I'll, I'll quickly explain what's there. Part of what we need to do is engage employers more actively, more participatorially, if that's a word, uh, in, the, in the hiring of immigrants at every stage of that continuum. So we're trying to find better ways to engage employers in the hiring process. The green uh, parts of that diagram show what the province is doing. We already register every employer who wants to recruit overseas. They have to register with the province first. What we're doing with those employers you know, is, is looking at what their needs are and saying, well, maybe before you go overseas, let's go to an employment agency like Manitoba Start and look at their database and see if those people aren't already here. And if they're not, we're saying, We've got people coming here on their way through the PNP. Maybe the skills you need are there. And if not, we have a number of strategic recruitment initiative options where we can go overseas with them and do uh, some facilitated hiring. The federal government is picking up on this theme a little bit through their express entry system, and employers will be able to screen candidates through the uh, uh, job bank, who, if employers select them, will be improved through the new federal selection system. So very quickly, you can get a sense of where immigration is going in, in Manitoba and Canada. We're tr all of us fed federal and provincial programs are trying to move to more skills sensitive, what I call calibrated programs. Um, how are we choosing the applicants who are, have the requirements that are most needed for our economy and for our labor market? Um, and that's really what Express Entry is doing. People submit expressions of interest. The federal government only chooses a certain number of them to be invited to apply based on their skills profiles or the fact that an employer has chosen them. The question we need to consider is how strong is our evidence base to inform that decision making? How do we know we're choosing the right people? That, I'll, I'll stop there, but that to me is the starting point for informing our research priorities. We'll put it very well. We need to go below the surface, what I'm calling here, move beyond the aggregate. Immigrant, the immigrant experience in Canada is not homogenous, it's dynamic, it's diverse and there's a strong need for research that reflects that diversity and that granularity. And I hope that's been a little bit of food for thought, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.